Hello, my name is Alva Hurst. Welcome to my art studio. It is located in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. I call it the Barnyard Art Studio and Gallery for obvious reasons. It is in a barn, a very old barn. This farm was established in 1859. My husband and four children moved here 18 years ago. And we enjoy many adventures here on the farm. In the studio, my students and I enjoy many art adventures. While hearing the chickens cackle and clock downstairs, and, or we might hear the cows out in the barnyard and the horses, even the pigs. All the while, we are enjoying pastels and oils, acrylics, watercolor painting, even colored pencil. As much as I enjoy all these mediums, there is an art that is by far my favorite. It is a forgotten art form called Chalk Talk. And I'll tell you more about how I discovered this fascinating art form if you join me by my easel. Before I share Chalk Talk with you, I want to show you a few things in this basket and tell you the story of how I discovered art in general. I was born and raised in an Old Order Mennonite family. We lived on a dairy farm. I was number eight of the nine children and I enjoyed early life very much on our farm. But like all other boys and girls, I had to go to school. So in the first grade, I joined my siblings on our quarter mile walk to our Amish and Mennonite school in our community. This is a picture of the one room school where I attended. I learned reading, writing, and arithmetic here all the way to eighth grade. And I thought that was such a lot of years to have to be in school. I did not enjoy academics very much. There was something else in my heart. And my eighth grade teacher noticed that at the end of the week, when she provided a time for us to color and draw, she noticed how much I enjoyed that time. And she encouraged me to learn how to paint. Now, in my background, painting and art was not encouraged. It was considered frivolous. So I realized that I would have to teach myself how to paint. And I did that by purchasing art books. I would buy these art books at garage sales and reuse at shops. And I would study these books from cover to cover. And I learned how to paint by practicing the step-by-step -step instructions. I read a valuable piece of advice in one of these art books one day. It said there's three things you need to do to be a good artist. Number one is practice. Number two is practice. And number three is practice. So I thought, okay, I can't go to art school, but I can practice, practice, practice. So when I was 14 years old, I made a commitment to practice painting every day. At first, my parents weren't very pleased. My father would say in Pennsylvania Dutch, ah, so so nady, which means that's unnecessary. But eventually, when he noticed that it was more than just a passing phase, and it actually started providing an income, he changed his tune and even offered to drive me to town to get art supplies and offer my work for sale at gift shops. So I would paint and paint and um, whatever items I could find around the farm. I painted on slate from the roof or stones from the field like this one. I even painted on glass jugs from mom's attic. This is one of my first pieces and I don't like it very much. But I quickly noticed the more I practiced, the better my pictures were. I did not have real artist paint, but I used my brother's model paints. And by mixing those eight colors that I had, I learned a valuable lesson of how to make new colors. I continued to paint through my teen years. I would still help dad milk the cows in the morning and help mom with breakfast and perhaps hang washing on the line. And then I'd sit down and paint until it was time to help her make supper and to milk the cows again. During the long hours that I spent painting, my mother would read books aloud to me. Books were very important in our life because we didn't have television or radio for our entertainment, so she provided wholesome books for us to read. i never forget when she read this book to me. It is called The Hiding Place, a true story of Corey Ten Boom, how her and her family hid the Jews during Nazi Germany. She survived the concentration camp, but most of her family had died. She traveled the world with a message that went like this. There is no pit so deep that God's love isn't deeper still. 
I began to experience God's love in a personal relationship when I accepted Christ as my personal Savior during this time. And I also became aware of God's calling on my life. And a desire began to grow in my heart to share the good news of the gospel. As a young Mennonite girl, I wasn't sure how this would be accomplished. But after spending some time on a missions trip when I was 18 years old, I came back from that trip saying, Lord, I don't ever want to live life to myself again. I always want to be serving you in one way or another. So I looked for opportunities to share the gospel, started backyard Bible clubs and things like that. Eventually, my boyfriend and I were married. We had left the plain community. He wanted to be a jet pilot. We wanted to go to Bible school, and that was not encouraged. So after our marriage, we moved to Tulsa, Oklahoma to attend Bible school. Our classmates noticed that we didn't have a television, and so they gave us one. We weren't sure what to do with it since we had grown up without one, but we turned it on, and I discovered the famous artist Bob Ross, the man with the cotton candy hair and his gentle voice. He would paint happy little clouds and happy little trees, and I was amazed at how quickly he would paint a beautiful scene, a beautiful oil painting in just 30 minutes. So I would record his shows, and I would paint with him. And for the first time in my life, I experienced oil painting on a canvas. And I felt like an artist as I painted the mountains with a palette knife and used the big brushes just like Bob Ross did. I learned so many things in this process about artwork. And I realize now, many years later, that much of what I learned from Bob Ross, I use in this art called Chalk Talk. It was also during this time that we were looking for jobs in the city, which was very difficult. We didn't have a diploma or a degree of any kind. All I could find in the way of work was cleaning jobs. One day I was cleaning my employer's closet, and I found a box of Sunday School materials that she had used in the past as a Sunday School teacher. She knew that I was learning all about children's ministry, and she said anything that I'd find in there that I think I would use in Sunday School, I could have it. I found a treasure in that box, and it is a book called Chalk Talk Made Easy, written by William Allen Bixler in 1931. I opened the book. I knew right away this would be a good way to teach the Bible stories to the children. Right away that first Sunday, I tried to think of a way to illustrate the lesson. The kids loved it, and I had a great time because I was doing art. Well, to make a long story short, 25 years later, I'm still doing Chalk Talk, and I can hardly wait to share this art with you. I'm going to share the Christmas story in Chalk. Please enjoy.
it's that wonderful time of year again. Time for cheery Christmas greetings of holly reefs and falling snow when landscape is transformed into a winter wonderland wrapped in white and glittering snow set aglow by colorful Christmas lights. The time of year when we again joy the beauty of the Ponceria, the joy of gift giving and goodwill. All these things indicate celebration. The word celebrate implies the marking of an event or joyous occasion with ceremony and festivities to commemorate the memory of someone or something. The reason for all the celebration goes beyond all the things that we do to celebrate, beyond the last Christmas cookie. It doesn't fade away with the poinsettia. The reason is eternal. To fully understand the reason, we must go back to Genesis. It is the book of beginnings, where creation took place. God created heaven and earth, and the very best and highest of his creation, he made man and woman. He made man to have rulership on the earth. He made for man the Garden of Eden. Eden means pleasure land, loveliness. It was in this special place of beauty where God walked and talked with man, and they had fellowship together. Before man, however, there was a moment in eternity past when the archangel Lucifer rebelled against the Most High God, and thereby was changed from Lucifer, a light-bearer of the divine glory, into Satan, an adversary of God. Lucifer was cast down to earth. An opposing kingdom of evil came into confrontation with God. The enemy, raging his fury against God, didn't allow his new enemy, man, to go unattacked and untempted. Satan disguised himself as a serpent. The tree of knowledge of good and evil became the battleground. To Adam and Eve, to eat or not to eat of the forbidden tree was not simply to test the flavor. It was the desire of Satan held before their power of choice to go behind the back of the Creator in a forbidden way, to accomplish what he himself failed to do as Lucifer, which was to rise to equal status with the Most High God. In disobedience to God's law, Adam and Eve rejected the absolute authority of God over man and accepted Satan's lie, the lie which made sin to look better than obedience to God. Adam and Eve sinned and came under God's judgment, Thus they were expelled from the garden. All creation was affected by the fall. The domain originally delegated to man now falls to Satan, and he became the god of this world. Sin separated man from God, and with Satan's reign came destruction, death, sickness, and all kinds of sorrow. All people who have been born since Adam have been born with a sinful nature. The Bible tells us just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, in this way death came to all men because all have sinned. Romans 3.23 says, All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The price of sin is death. And so the sin in the garden separated man from God. Man experienced spiritual death and consequently he would experience physical death. God had lost his relationship with man, but he wanted his man back. So he set into motion his plan of redemption, beginning with the law and continuing through his son. And so God's mission to get his man back really begins in Genesis 3. God in his perfect love for mankind had a plan. He promised that he would send someone to crush Satan's head, meaning to take away Satan's authority from over mankind and to save us from our sin and to restore God's goodness to us. Who is this person? When would this person come? The Old Testament was written to create an anticipation of and to pay the way for the coming of Christ. Throughout the story of the Hebrew nation, there runs an increasing expectancy and provision for the coming of that one majestic person who would rule and bless the whole world. This person, long before he arrived, came to be known as the Messiah. The predictions and foregleams of his coming constitutes the messianic strain of the Old Testament. They form a golden thread, extending through and binding together its many and diverse books into one amazing unity. Prophetic announcements of his coming appear throughout the pages of the Old Testament history, the Psalms and the Prophets. In Isaiah we read, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign, 
Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. In Micah we are told where he was to be born. But thou, Bethlehem, Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel, whose going forth have been from of old, from everlasting. And so the story of Christ is pre-written, prefigured, and foretold, unlike any other person in history. God chose Bethlehem to be the center of God's age-long effort to reveal himself to mankind. Finally, God's appointed time had come. Let's read this beautiful story together right from the book of Luke, chapter 2. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to his own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the child to be born and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn.
there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. baby boy, Jesus, who was divinely begotten, yet fully human, but sinless. Just as it had been prophesied, the Messiah was born to the family of David, to be born in Bethlehem. Though the chosen parents lived in Nazareth, which was a hundred miles from Jerusalem, a decree of Rome required them to go to Bethlehem, just as the child was to be born. Thus, God made the decree of a pagan emperor to be the instrument of fulfilling his prophecies. God's providence had prepared the world for the coming of Christ, and this was the fittest time in all history. All the world was subject to one government, so the apostles could travel everywhere. The door of every land was open for the gospel. The world was at peace, so the gospel could have free course. Therefore, God's plan to get his man back was being fulfilled in careful detail.
As the events of Jesus' life continue, in the New Testament he shows us what God is like through his teaching and preaching and healing the people. He lived 33 years on the earth, and then came the day that he died on the cross. There he took your and my sins, for he had no sins of his own, taking the punishment of our sins. Remember, the wages of sin is death. He died and was buried, but he rose to life again on the third day and went to heaven to prepare a place for all who would believe on him and receive him. When we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and receive him as our Lord and Savior, Satan is no longer the Lord of our lives, but God the Father is, and he is a loving Father. The Bible says, as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. Through Christ we are made alive again unto God. Once again, our fellowship with God is restored. Sin no longer separates us from God. And we experience freedom from sin's bondages. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. On Christmas Day, this is what we celebrate. For unto us is born a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. On Christmas Day, we celebrate Jesus, God's gift of love. It is a gift that does not get old or wear out or change with time. This gift will last for an eternity. Upon receiving this gift, you experience the everlasting joy of Christmas. The light of God's love fills your heart and brightens your world as the true light of Christmas glow. The presence of God in us fills our holidays like nothing else can. Jesus is the reason for the season. Receive him and celebrate. I wonder if this Christmas The Jesus that they celebrate is much more than a man. Cause the way the world is, I don't see how people can deny. The only way to save us was for Jesus Christ to die. Saint Nicholas were here, he would agree that Jesus gave the greatest gift of all to you and me. They led him to the slaughter on a hill. And mankind was forgiven when they nailed him to the tree. But most of all the children, they're the ones I hope will learn. That Jesus is our Savior and he is going to return. That Christmas isn't just a day And all days aren't the same Perhaps they'll think about the world And see it spells his name And I know if Saint Nicholas were here He would agree that Jesus gave the greatest gift of all to you and me. They led him to the slaughter on a hill called Calvary. And mankind was forgiven. Mankind was forgiven. Man
Well, I hope you enjoyed that chalk art experience and a little visit to the Barnyard Art Studio and Gallery. If you ever find yourself in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania and you'd like to arrange for a visit, you can do so by simply making a reservation through our website or calling the number on the screen. Thanks again. God bless you and Merry Christmas.